first? Yeah, so welcome everyone. This is our second Monday Night Book Club, and the idea being that we bring a few people together, we invite an author or a poet or illustrator in the future to come and tell us a little bit about themselves, tell us what they've done, why they've done it, and maybe some of us will then read their book and also be brave enough to join in and ask a few questions. So I've been in the book world for 33 years. I know I am that old. And um, this came about a couple of weeks ago. George and Julie, who have been long-standing friends of mine, George and I grew up together. I mean, you know, they got married roughly when we got married, got kids the same age. And they, the penny suddenly dropped. Julie suddenly said, you know, this, you know, you, what are you doing at the moment with your, um, you know, your bookshop and all that? I said, well, it's all online, isn't it? She goes, why don't we do something where we get an author or two in and do a book club chat? So... Um, the idea also is George and Julie run an interesting thing called NLP, which George will give us a very brief blurb on. And then we'll pass over to our wonderful guest author, Ruth, Ruth Turnbull, who's up there with her very nice Christmas banner. And she's going to tell us a little bit about herself. I think she might do a reading. Yeah. Yeah. And um, she'll tell us a bit about herself and her wonderful book or books and then ask some questions and away we go. So George, just, just give us a little very brief blurb on, on you and NLP. Um, so yeah, uh, NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming. Um, I'm the, the main trainer with NLP Liverpool and uh, that's run with, with uh, Julie, uh, my wife, who's just waving there, who is the boss, obviously. This is where the forelocks have all gone. And uh, for those of you that don't know anything about NLP, NLP is basically a, a, a subjective study of excellence. So in other words, we find people who are brilliant at what they do codify and understand how they do what they do and we teach it to other people um, it's used in coaching it's used in personal development it's used in sales marketing there's so many applications of nlp and we found out over the years since doing the courses that, that we run the nlp practitioner courses and the master practitioner courses that an awful lot of our students actually go on and actually start writing books for themselves and we thought wow we've got this fantastic resource in there what a you know what an opportunity and as i say chatting with uh, with tony after one of our events um it suddenly dawned on us that we've got a whole host of really really interesting people and ruth is one of our students who is you know really interested and has written books and everything and dead clever um and we thought fantastic let's use these this this connection that we've got use this network um help our students help Tony and also actually it's just interesting you know we had a great time last week um, you know chatting about the books and with Nathan and in fact after we went off live uh, we ended up chatting away for another half an hour maybe three quarters of an hour probably actually nearly an hour um, and we just thought yeah let's just do this it's just so much we can we can contribute so I hope you enjoy it as much as we've enjoyed it um, and back over to you Tony and then probably over to Ruth. Yep, so what we're going to do is if everyone can just make sure, apart from Ruth, if you all mute yourselves, and then we'll put Ruth on big screen and let her say hello. I think she's going to do a little reading. I think being read to is a nice thing. And then fill us in without giving too much away about a book, because that's the hard thing when you talk about a book that, well, she's written it, but when you've read it even, it's what can you tell someone that won't tell them so much that they think, oh, I don't need to read that now. You know, you've told me everything I need to know. So I've been reading the book. I am thoroughly enjoying it. It's You pick it up on page one. You, you've you read 50 pages before you even blink. And, and basically you're thrown into a wonderful world that she's created. Brilliant characters. Clever, clever idea. But I'm not going to tell you anything about it. We're going to let Ruth do all that. So I'm going to meet myself. I'm going to put Ruth on big screen and enjoy yourselves, folks. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, George. Um, so yeah, I'll just tell you a little bit about me um, and my writing journey. So um, my name is Ruth Turnbull. I am from Edinburgh. Um, I live in the West Midlands currently. I am a writer and a singer. 
I am a licensed NLP practitioner and I um, trained with George at NLP Liverpool earlier this year. I am a licensed uh, life coach. Um, I have my own coaching company called Coaching You, um, which uh, basically using visualization to help clients to overcome challenging situations, find direction and anchor positive emotions. So um, if that is something that you feel like you might need help with, then um, you can email me um, at uh, coachingu10 at gmail.com and we can have a, a little chat and I'll just um, post that email address. There you go in the comments for those on Zoom if you, uh, if you would like to contact me. Um, I have worked in communications, uh, employee engagement, business change and marketing over the last 13 years. And I'm about to start a new role as a change in communications manager working for Bowline Communications Agency. Uh, Bowline's communications and um, engagement agency uh, with a knack of motivating teams and inspiring customers. Um, we drive value for businesses through uh, sort of an inside out approach, um, which is very appealing to me um, from an NLP point of view. So um, if any of you do happen to work for an organization, <laughs> that uh, is looking for um, communication support at all, um, then um, please do check out Bowline's website. Um, I've posted the link for you there. Um, and go and have a look um, and uh, let them know that Ruth referred you. <laughs> um, so I've tried all sorts of writing over the years. Um, I started out with short stories, um, then wrote novels, then moved into plays, poetry and songs. Um, I've won awards for nonfiction and poetry, and I've had the pleasure of seeing two of my plays performed at the Travis Theatre in Edinburgh, which is the home for new writing in Scotland. In June last year, uh, no, this year even, God, it's been such a long year, <laughs> June this year, um, I achieved um, a long-term dream of mine, uh, which was to actually uh, become a recording artist, um, recording my first original song, uh, which I wrote with um, the extremely talented uh, Sean Frearson. Um, it's called Stay Strong. Uh, you can buy it from all the usual platforms, Amazon, iTunes, Google Play, but you can actually go to YouTube and watch the music video that we filmed in lockdown for free. Um, so if you um, would like to go and, and check it out after this session, um, I will just post the link to that for you in the chat as well. So it's easily accessible for you. There you go. Um, it's worth a listen. It is an absolutely beautiful song. Um, so I really would recommend going and have a listen to that. Um, so that was a major uh, a life achievement for me. Um, but then in July, um, I actually achieved my number one life goal. Um, I've always written my whole life and um, I wanted to be a published author. And in July, uh, that goal came to pass uh, with the publication of my first book, Immortal Part One. And that was such an amazing experience. I mean, I've never actually felt anything quite like that. Um, holding my book in my hands, feeling you know, the weight of it, looking at the, the cover, um, you know, looking at my name, looking at the, there's just the words on the pages being words that I had written and knowing that this book was out there and that people could enjoy it as much as I had enjoyed actually writing it and creating those characters and they could get to love it as much as I, as I love it. So it was a really, really special moment. Um, but then in November, beginning of this month, um, I uh, superseded my life goal, um, which I had never thought about. Um, as with most people, I think we have a goal and, you know, if we can attain that goal, great. We don't really think of, you know, um, what comes next. And uh, yeah, I superseded it with the publication of the second book in the Immortal series, uh, Immortal Part Two. Um, and it was at that point, holding both books in my hands and looking uh, at the two covers side by side, um, I realised that um, I had achieved what I'd set out to and become you know, the author of a book. But now I'd actually become the author of a book series, uh, which was a whole other thing. And I've created this character whose life spans so many years, um, there is so much, uh, you know, he might have seen or might have done. So sort of the uh, 
openness to actually have a, a, a series of many books is there. So um, it is something that I'm thinking about for those who've read the first and maybe second book as well and are wondering if there will be another. Uh, stay tuned, there may well be. Uh, <laughs> so that's the headlines. Um, so now I'll just tell you a bit about my writing journey and specifically how the concept for Immortal actually came about. So, as I said, my passion has always been telling stories and, um, you know, stories which are engaging and entertaining. So, you know, whether it's non-fiction, so creating clear, accessible messages which inspire people to, to take ownership and to develop and grow. Um, or if it's fictional plots um, with the joy of creating characters and that are as real and unique and unpredictable as you and I, and actually exploring their worlds. And I, I remember when I was writing Immortal, um, I had a friend uh, who I was using as a sounding board, sort of reading uh, an early draft to her. And I remember um, we were walking in Sweden uh, in this almost, uh, fairy tale like architecture <laughs> and um, and having this really passionate conversation about the characters and the behavior of one of the characters in particular towards my protagonist and my friend's reaction was so, she was so incensed by this character's behavior towards the protagonist that she just said kill her <laughs> and to see and hear someone become so passionate about a fictional character that I had created and to care enough about the protagonist that they felt passionate enough to, um, you know, feel that on his behalf <laughs> was just quite incredible. Um, and, you know, with, with all writing, that's what I'm aiming to do is create these real life characters that feel as real to you as, you know, your best mate. So, um, that was an amazing moment um, to have that reaction. Um, the thing to, uh, so it basically, if you're gonna write stories, you've got to read them. As a writer, that's something I'd say is very, very important. You, you, you have to read stories. And I love reading and I've got a very eclectic reading list. Um, I started my reading journey uh, with Point Horror, uh, in particular, The Fun House by R.L. Stein. Um, I just devoured all the point horror books. Um, they just told, you know, really simple, fun stories, which were really easy to follow. So great books when you're a kid. Um, other books that have stood out across the years are um, J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye, uh, Ian Banks' The Wasp Factory, uh, Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles. Um, nowadays, I enjoy reading Ben Aranovich, Neil Gaiman, Kate Morton, Kate Atkinson, Jane Austen. So uh, a real mix of genres and writing styles. And I love the English language. I love the, the ebb and flow. And I'm always curious to play with it, to, to find the right words for a character to express, you know, their unique personality um, or how much description or attention to detail there needs to be in a scene to get that balance right for the reader. You know, to create a world which feels real but which leaves the reader room for imagination and interpretation. And when learning NLP with George, I loved this aspect of the technique, especially in trance states, the, the vagary of language used to enable the client to fill in the gaps with their own memories and feelings. It just makes for a much richer experience. So I, I try and do that within my writing um, for, for the audience. Um, I also love the hilarity of the English language because it has to be the silliest language in the whole world. Um, growing up, you were told to, you know, spell it as it sounds, sound it out. You don't spell English the way it sounds. There are silent O-U-G-Hs in the middle of words. It's, it's a ridiculous notion. And I love that we use the same sounding words spelt differently to mean different things. And I love it when authors, um, accidentally write the wrong version of a word, um, often due to hurried typing or the grammar check of thinking that it knows better than you and changing it without you noticing. Um, and this can create the most uh, wonderful, unintentional, hilarious imagery in the mind. And sometimes if this uh, 
error actually occurs during dialogue. Um, I kind of think of it like a, a secret joke between the character and the reader kind of breaking down the fourth wall. Um, so my passion for language means that I'm, I'm always listening to what people say and how they say it and watching uh, their, their subtle mannerisms because these small details, um, like a particular turn of phrase or, or a gesture, are what builds convincing characters. Um, I wrote my first full-length novel when I was 14, and second uh, a couple of years after that. Um, but as a teenager, I wanted instant gratification, as teenagers do. Um, and I realized I could experience the audience reaction firsthand if I wrote plays. So I joined the Travers Theatre Young Writers Group. And there is nothing quite like sitting anonymously within the audience of your own play, experiencing the audience's reaction to your work and watching your characters and your stories coming to life, being brought to life uh, before your very eyes. There is literally nothing quite like that experience. And I still remember watching um, my first play um, it was a it was a dark comedy called Christmas Turkey, and at the point of the big reveal, um, the whole audience, as one, sat forward in their seats, and then as the reveal came, there was an audible, and then they all sat back, and you actually heard the clunk creak of the seating mechanism. And to be sitting anonymously within that audience and experience that was the most incredible thing. I, I remember it brought me to tears. Um, if you ever get the opportunity to write a play, sit anonymously in your audience, <laughs> because it is the best way to get feedback. Um, they will say exactly what they think because they don't know the author is sitting uh, in the row in front of them. Um, so it's a wonderful, wonderful experience to have. Um, I think sometimes, um, you know, we shy away from, from trying new things, um, even if we really want to do them. And um, I think that's because, you know, we, we don't maybe think that we have the skills to do it. Um, so for example, I didn't think that I could write poems, but then after uni, I joined a writer's group, they had a poetry writing competition. So I thought I'll give it a go. So I wrote my first ever poem and it won first prize. So then I was like, oh, I can write poems, great. So then, la earlier of last year, when um, Sean asked me to write a song with him, and my first reaction was, I can't write a song. I'd love to write a song. Um, I've always been a singer. I have um, created um, a cappella arrangements for my a cappella choir, um, but I have never written an original song because while I could write words, I don't have the musical ability on an instrument to be able to create that melody. Um, but Sean did. Sean is fantastic at that. So when you actually uh, brought us together and I realized that a song is just a poem to music. So I wrote a poem because now I knew I could write those. Um, and we created, you know, the most beautiful, beautiful song. Um, so yeah, never, never be afraid to try something new um, or shy away from something because if you can't do it alone, there is someone else who you can join up with and you can you can pull your pull your skill sets and you can you can make it happen. Whatever it is you, you want to do, you can make it happen. Um, so, so don't be afraid of it. Um, the response that I've received to my Immortal series has been amazing. Um, Immortal Part 1 has received uh, four and five star reviews uh, and people are buying Immortal Part 2. Um, and it's it's been lovely to see how much people are enjoying it uh, from the reviews that they've written. Um, and enjoying it, you know, as much as I enjoyed writing it. And I hope that um, if you choose to buy a copy, if you haven't already, um, please do go to the store where you bought it and leave a review because I would absolutely love to know what you thought. Um, I'd really love to, to hear from people. So please do go and review it at the store where you bought it. Um, it'd be really great um, if, you, if you want to do that. Um, so um, you can buy my books. Um, from my website, uh, well, not literally from my website, but there is a list on my website. There you go. I've posted um, a link to my website uh, in the in the chat. So if you go there, there are links to everywhere where you can buy my books, um, and they're available from bookstores and online. 
um, worldwide. Um, so you can go and, and buy them anywhere uh, in paperback or ebook. Um, but all the links are on my website if you want to check it out. Um, and the link to where you can buy the song is also on there. So let me just tell you a little bit about the protagonist and how this idea came about. Um, so I'd seen and, and read sort of a lot of stories about immortal characters, um, but they always had uh, two things in common. Either they were not alone, there was always somebody else like them or they could make somebody else like them, or they had superpowers. And I thought, what if you didn't? What if you were just you? And you didn't age and you couldn't die, but apart from that, you were just you. So how would you cope? How would you actually cope with that? You know, you'd have to deal with um, industrial and technological and cultural changes. You'd have to deal with the people that you loved growing old, uh, you know, dying, or you'd have to leave them before they noticed that you weren't aging. You'd have to work for a living because you'd have to continue to earn money. So well, what would that do to you? What would that do to, to your, your mental health? You know, how would you actually cope in that situation? So I started to develop this uh, character, Alex Crowther. And I spent three years uh, researching his life, all 262 years of it. Um, it is great fun researching a fictional character. Um, in life, you know you get those uh, coincidences uh, when you go to the other side of the world and you meet someone who you know, went to school with your best friend from college. So you, those coincidences can happen in fiction too. And while um, researching sort of where my character you know, might have been and you know, whose paths he might have crossed um, during, during the, the various times uh, in his 262 years, um, I came across a, a fun coincidence for him. Um, so Alex um, was an investor in um, Islamabad Kingdom Brunel's Great Western Steamship Company, uh, and he was on the maiden voyage to New York. And when he arrived, um, he was making new contacts and um, he was introduced um, to a, a gentleman, um, Matthew C. Perry, who is a Commodore in the United States Navy, uh, who was an advocate for modernizing the US Navy by introducing them to steam powered engines uh, on ships. So um, that got them talking about the Great Western, which got them talking about Brunel. And Perry mentioned that the Park House Theatre in New York, where um, he and his friends like to go, and which he invited Alex to, to join them at, uh, was actually uh, built by Brunel's father, Mark um, Islamabad Brunel. So, uh, you know, Alex is then able to write home to Brunel and tell him that he's been to his father's theatre. So you get these wonderful coincidences happening in, in, in fictitious history um, when aligned with real history. Um, so it's, a, it's great fun to do. Um, so I love it when I'm reading a story um, and there are references to places or things. And I wonder if it's real. And you know, if I went there, would I see that? Or would that really happen? And you know that a lot of the time it wouldn't but the fact that the storyteller can draw you in and actually put that thought into your mind is wonderful. And I wanted to achieve that within my books uh, by making them as real as possible um, in their setting and their detail, which is why I spent three years researching them uh, before I started to write. So <clears throat> to give you an overview of the book, I am going to read the uh, back cover blurb and then I'm going to read um, chapter one of Immortal Part One. Um, but before I do, I just want to say this. You can achieve your dream, whatever it is. So people say to me, you know, I want to write a book, but, you know, I, I, I don't even know where to start. My advice, just write. Don't worry about what you're writing or if it's succinct or if it makes sense. It doesn't matter. Find a stimulus, you know, randomly open a book, you know, at a random page, close your eyes and, you know, randomly pick a picture or pick a sentence and 
set yourself a five minute timer, write the sentence down and just keep writing for five minutes solid. It's called automatic writing or take the picture and, you know, just study it for a minute and then just write about it for five minutes solid and think about, you know, what is this picture telling us? Whose eyes are we seeing this picture through? You know, maybe there's a character there. And these sort of exercises um, just come up with, with so many wonderful little um, ideas for characters and situations and places that, you know, can sort of you can use in your books or they can start you on your way to actually writing something. So just write, uh, read a lot. It's important to read a lot uh, and don't worry about the editing. Editing is a separate thing. Editing happens after the writing, just write. Don't think about it, just, just do it. Um, you can achieve whatever it is you wanna do. So I'll just have a quick drink. So, Immortal Part One. Alex Crowther has a secret. He may look like an ordinary 30-year-old man, but he's been alive for 262 years. Alone in his immortality, unable to age or die, Alex struggles to find his purpose in an ever-changing world. Through the Industrial Revolution into the technological, Alex's adventures take him from his apothecary in Regency London to surgeon and lecturer in 18th century New York and Boston to the trenches of the Western Front. He's worked hard to build his international pharmaceutical company, all the while searching for an answer to his condition and a way to either share it or end it. Now, forced to leave another life he enjoyed before people start to ask questions, Alex finds an opportunity to reunite with his family. But can he reveal his condition to Charlie, an old man who he knew as a boy? Will Charlie accept him? And can he reveal his true nature to Kara, Charlie's granddaughter? Little does he know that the biggest challenges are yet to come. There we go. Okay. So, Immortal Part One, Chapter One. Alex often wondered what it'd be like to grow old, to suffer from rheumatic twinges, a stiffness and swelling of the joints, to have to constantly consider your environment, the evenness of a path, the height of a chair. He reached up and plucked a book from the top shelf. To be unable to do something so simple without care and consideration, an ailing shell. And all the time your mind astute and alive as ever, filled with a life of knowledge, squinting through your cataracts, your voice sluggish as you fight to communicate the abundance of information through old, tired muscles. He licked his thumb and flicked through the book until he came to the page he had marked with a red flourish. He had scored neatly through the word foxgloves and written in the margin digitoxin. The plant extract was used in modern medicine to treat an irregular heartbeat and combined with atropine from the deadly nightshade, which was used to treat certain heart conditions. Alex considered that they should be along the right lines to help his to stop. It wasn't that he wanted to die. He just felt fatigued to his core. A waning listlessness had come over him that no amount of technology or cultural shifts could lift. And he had decided that he needed to know there was a way out, should he need it. True, in the past he had discovered that even those potions certain to fell a rhino had but given him the briefest of headaches, a momentary discomfort in the gut, or a deep and restful sleep. But this was a new time. Medicines had come a long way since those days. He touched the locket beneath his shirt. Surely by now, they must have discovered a way to kill him. Alex carefully cut into the bulb of the deadly nightshade and let the liquid contents drip into the beaker before licking his fingers. After all, it couldn't hurt. He watched the concoction bubble over the Bunsen burner. The cellar room was small and filled with lab equipment, glass, wood, steel, gas pipes. Alex drummed his fingers off the table wondering what else he could add to give it that extra kick. His gaze slid to the sink with its bottles of bleach and other sterilization fluids, and shrugging, he retrieved the bottle, 
and poured a generous helping into the beaker. The explosion knocked him off his feet. Glass and wood fragments were everywhere, digging into his scalp, his arms, his face burned from the bleach. Struggling to sit up, he felt the aching crack of bone as his right leg twisted at the knee. His legs were pinned beneath the rubble. Thick black smoke blinded him, choking him with its noxious odour. He could hear the gas pipes hissing and he knew that a second explosion was imminent. Inwardly, he sighed. This hadn't been his intention. He had wanted a potion that would take him out quickly and painlessly. He didn't want to suffer. This would take a while to recover from, and the longer he sat there feeling sorry for himself, the longer it would take. He got his hands under the lip of the debris that was pinning him down and pulled with all his might. It didn't shift. There was a crash from above and a shower of wood dust rained down on him. He thought of his possessions, of his priceless paintings and sculptures, which should have been in a museum rather than hoarded for his own pleasure. He hadn't thought this through. He should have built the lab as a separate building, not in the basement. Then he could have just waited for it to either fall or burn down or crawl out of the rubble. By the time his grand 18th century mansion finished falling down and burning, he was likely to be so buried that no one would even think to look for him. He pulled his shirt sleeve over his mouth. The smoke was vicious and made him cough. He felt like his lungs were struggling, inflating and deflating in a rickety effort to find oxygen. Alex only wished that a lack of oxygen would do the trick. There was another crack from above and a section of the wooden floor dropped like a javelin, piercing the rubble which pinned him and cracking it in two. Alex pulled his legs free and dragged himself across the room towards the emergency door he had installed in the rear wall. Hauling himself to his feet, he leant forward on his right leg and heard the splintering of bone faintly over the roar of the flames at his back. His shoulder felt like it was in an oven and he wondered if he were on fire. Feeling along the stone wall, his palm connected with the metal door and groping for the handle, he pushed down on it and the heavy door creaked slowly outwards. The earthy tunnel was cool and smelled of damp and iron. Alex leant back against the door so that it locked closed, containing the fire and the billowing black smoke. He waved his hand in front of him to clear the preceding cloud, then coughing rubbed at his streaming eyes. This wasn't how he wanted to end it. Irritated by the evening's events, he stumbled up the dark tunnel, leaning his palms against the walls to support and guide him. His escape was slow due to only one of his feet pointing in the right direction, and he wondered again if this was what old age felt like. The tunnel ascended at a slight incline, ending at another heavy metal door. Fumbling for the lever, he pushed down on it, and with a grind and a click, the door sprang open and he limped out onto the grass of the east lawn. It was raining. The grass was boggy and the rain hit him side on. He dropped to the ground and rolled in the cool mud. He lay on his back and took great greedy lungfuls of the wet air. The action made him shiver with pleasure. Surmising that lying in the mud so close to the tunnel's edge was not the brightest of ideas, he pulled himself up using the tunnel entrance and staggered in the direction of the trees which bordered the grounds. A small clearing in the woods to the east of the house was where Alex inevitably found himself. It was a great spot to sunbathe, hidden and secluded, and although he owned the house and all the land around it, Alex often found that this was the only place he could come to revive himself where he wouldn't feel disturbed. As he lay dreaming, the rain stopped and the sun skirted the horizon, its healing rays penetrating his body. Though weak with the early morning mist, the sun started to heal his face, roping blood and muscle and nerves and skin back together. So when the shadow fell over him, blocking out the deep pink of his eyelids, his face was at least complete. Opening his eyes, he saw a middle-aged woman in a peak cap staring down at him. Her features were small and perfectly proportioned and her eyes a light speckled grey. 
A couple of wisps of hair had escaped from her regimented bun and hung forward as she bent further over to get a good look at him. Her pink lips were moving. Can you hear me? He blinked at her. He got the distinct impression that this was not the first time she'd asked him this question. My name's PC Ryan, I'm with the police. Can you tell me your name? Alex frowned at her, then slowly sat up. Take it easy, said PC Ryan, and he heard the crackle of radio static. The ambulance team will be here in a moment. Can you tell me your name? Alex Crowther, said Alex. Then looking at his twisted leg, he raised a hand to touch his burnt cheek and saw the red raw skin on his arm. So here he was, lying in the mud by the charred remains of his house, burned and broken, but unable to die. He lay back down. The radio crackled again, and PC Ryan told someone that she'd found the proprietor. Mr Crowther, she said, leaning over him again. Alex realised that she was kneeling by his side in the mud. Was there anyone else in the building? Alex shook his head, and with a crackle of radio static, PC Ryan confirmed that there were no other casualties. An ambulance team arrived beside them, carrying a stretcher and first aid kit. Alex didn't protest as they lifted him onto the stretcher and carried him through the wood to the ambulance. He saw the barren remains of his house. The north and south towers had collapsed in on themselves and jutted up at an angle, giving the building a look of antenna, a squat blackened bug on the horizon. He didn't argue as they loaded him into the ambulance and placed the oxygen mask over his nose and mouth. He didn't need the mask, but it did feel good to have oxygen flowing into his smoke-choked lungs. There was no harm in letting them take him to the hospital. There was nothing they could do to harm him. Undoubtedly, they would reset his leg and treat his burns. And after a few days, he'd be released and the son would do the rest. He just felt foolish for trying to find a way out when 262 years had shown him that there wasn't one. Excellent. That was brilliant, Ruth. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, folks, you can unmute yourselves now. I think we we, we can um, we can go back to we're all in this together type type look. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it lovely being read to? Is everyone? No one fell asleep, did they? No. I'm looking George in the eye. No, he's still awake. No, still awake. <laughs> It's actually Julian Alban I'd be worried about because they've got comfy seats. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that. It's lovely. It is lovely, isn't it? There's something yeah. lovely about hearing a story read to you, whatever mm. age you are. You know, um, so, I mean, I've read I've read about 100 pages of the book and I really wish I'd read more, but it, it's fitting it in at the moment. It's, it's nice to say I'm busy at the moment, but it, it spoils the fun because if you're busy, you can't relax and... You know, I, you know, read or, or listen to music. So the first question I have, in 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 a way, is um, when you created someone who was immortal, was your first thought that you wanted to genuinely come up with a way to kill him? <laughs> um, no, um, I think it's it, it's quite. There's, there's always. Um, that's the other thing in sort of the, the stories when someone is immortal, half the time they aren't actually immortal because, you know, their magic sword cuts their head off. Yeah. And so, you know, oh, I thought you were immortal. Why can't you survive having your head cut off by a sword? So, you know. <laughs> um, That's I want... that Scottish film we were talking about. It's it? that Scottish <laughs> film, yes. <laughs> but uh, other immortal films are available. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't, it literally was the, the, the concept um, that, that I explained before, um, was that, you know, if, if you were just you, you know, um, just thinking about kind of what people go through in life, you know, normally, um, in, in your adult life, you know, if you're, if you're lucky, you've maybe got like sort of 60 years, you know, um, that if you had 260, you know, like what would it be like? I mean, the amount of changes that there's been within my lifetime, um, you know, that the, the internet didn't exist, you know, when I was born and I'm not old, <laughs> so, you know, so it's, it's, you know, there's been so many changes. It's so fast. And how would you cope with that? Um, you know, if you're born in sort of, you know, the mid 1800s, how would you cope with an iPhone? 
you know. Well, he finds out. He does. He does dabble with technology, doesn't he? <laughs> he's very good at it. Um, he's one of those people. Luckily for him, he's got a scientific mind, so he's actually very curious and he enjoys taking things apart and discovering things. And um, so he understands technology. Uh, he he gets to understand it. You know, he gets to know it because he's he's interested and he's curious um, to to know it. So and anyone who's um, Hazel and Hillary uh, particularly, if you want to type a question into the chat box, guys, just feel free and one of us will, well, Ruth will see it. Um, but, you know, if, if anyone wants to put the hand up and ask a question, George, have you, have you, you've been making notes again, I think. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> and actually, I think, Ruth, you, you answered the question because it was when you were talking earlier on about, um, you know, stories, you know, capturing, uh, captivating you uh, and capturing the imagination. I had actually written down what was the first story that truly captured your imagination. Now, that might have been the book that you mentioned earlier on. Or maybe it was something that your mum read you or a story that your mum told you. I don't know. Val, was there something that captured her as a, as a child? The, the, fir <laughs> the first story that I remember, and the, I might, this might have been read to me first, but I remember seeing it as a, as a play. Um, and now I'm probably going to say the wrong name of it. <laughs> um, but it's actually um, the, the story... Um, it's not, is it? No, it's not called the Snow Queen. It's the, it's, it's the book that Frozen's based on. People don't even realise Frozen's based on another book. Um, I've completely forgotten the name of it. It's, no, it's the Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. It is, it's the Snow it's, Queen. It's basically it is. the gist of it, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it is the Snow Queen. I thought, I think I had the title on there. Yeah, that's the first story um, that I remember, like, really um, having an affinity with um, and just thinking, wow, um, Every, your characters everything just you know the imagination just poof, explodes you know um so yeah fantastic story cool and what was it about it actually that that captured you um i think it was the uh the relationships between this the brother and the sister and sort of the lengths that she'd go to and um you know that sort of adventure sort of having to cross the ice and the idea of having the you know the shard of ice in your heart which then makes you cold and withdrawn and, you know, trying to save him so that she can have her brother back as he was, um, that with, with the love and everything. Um, so it was um, a very emotive story. Um, and I think it's, it's that sort of emotional drive and that journey and that relationship um, that really struck me. So yeah, I probably so didn't think that when I was like five or something. <laughs> I probably just thought this is really cool. <laughs> some, something older might know, um, Hans Christian Andersen, famously became friends with Charles Dickens. Yeah, he did. And he came he, to he, stay with him, didn't he? And He, uh, he bored him. Didn't he outstay as well? Oh, he did, yes. Yeah. based on language. <laughs> yeah. he, even though he wrote wonderful stories, he was a really yeah. boring chap, wasn't he? He was. <laughs> <laughs> so he put all his efforts into the stories and not, not into himself, yeah. But Dickens <laughs> just kept going out for the day and, you know, taking notes and going for cups of coffee or tea or whatever. Came home and he was still there, wasn't he? Yeah. He was telling his daughters, you, you tell him to go. Well, no, you tell him. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that sort of situation. Because you think two great literary minds like that meeting up would, would, would be a wonderful event, wouldn't you? But not so as the case was, really. But um, no, they, they... Anne, Anne or Jill, have you, or Peter, have any of you got a question? I was going to ask Ruth about, uh, you know, did she self publish uh, or did she go, did you go through? Uh, you know, somebody else to publish a book? Um, no, I self-published. Um, I basically researched um, all the traditional publishers um, and self-publishing um, and then made a decision based on what was important to me, so sort of what my values were. And um, I decided um, that basically with self-publishing, you have full creative autonomy. So, you know, my book covers, um, I hired a designer to create them, but they're my covers. They, they are literally what was in my brain. Um, I still think the designer is absolutely amazing. Um, Mibble art for anybody who wants a book cover designed. Um, and they're in the Ukraine. So uh, to, uh, only via email to be able to take an image in my brain and actually put it on a book cover, which was um, the first one. Um, 
absolutely amazing. But that is what I had envisaged in my brain. Um, with traditional publishers, um, you don't get a say in the cover. It does, it's not your deal, it's, it's someone else's. You don't have to say in that. Um, and also, um, you're in control of the whole process of the sales and everything. Um, you set the prices. Um, you actually get more royalties because there isn't a middleman taking a cut because it's direct for you um, with the distributors. Um, and today it is so easy. Uh, it's a lot of work um, uh, and, and as part of my coaching you business, one of the things I actually offer specifically to authors who are looking to self-publish is um, how to self-publish your book because it's, it's, a, it's a complete jungle um, out there. You can't go and ask anybody, so how do I self-publish a book? No one will tell you because there isn't one way to self-publish a book. There are a million. And depending on your genre and the type of, you know, uh, fiction, non-fiction, whatever, um, the, the path you have to take will be unique. Um, but, you know, I've carved out um, a path for me that I know that works. And then I was able to test and refine that path with my second book. So I have a process that I know that works so I can help I can help uh, would be authors to publish their work now. So if you are looking to self publish you're a would be author, <laughs> come see me. <laughs> that, that, Coaching you. <laughs> that, that's that's a good thing to point out that building this platform on. At some point, the idea is to do a bit of a, a Q and A workshop, as opposed to just, "Hey, I've written a book. It's great. Hope you read it." You know, we want both sides of the equation for people because, jokingly, everyone has got a story to tell. You know, Alban might write one about Blackpool winning the FA Cup in twenty twenty one. You you just don't know yet, do you? Fiction. You're yeah, fiction. But he could, he could <laughs> fifty three. You know, he could write it now. And get, get outside the ground selling copies. Anglo Italian Cup 1971. <laughs> Was that when they won it? Yeah. They did. <laughs> yeah. The, the Cup in 53. The Anglo, the, when we were in Europe, uh, uh, 71. But don't start me on that. I won't stop. Uh, <laughs> but that's the thing. We've all got a passion. They always say you should write what you know. And mm -hmm. obviously, Ruth obviously must have loved you know subliminally loved regency and you know that that period of time to I do. Was that, is that what came was that period the first thing you wanted in the book or or did that come later um when i was forming the character um there was an element to him that was very mr darcy um which um just kind of kept coming back and and you know it it, it took, uh, as with all characters, it took a while for him to sort of form and to, to find his voice. And I sort of, you know, started a few different versions of the book to, um, and, and the character that I ended up with is kind of an amalgamation of different aspects within those, you know, different versions. Um, but yes, he, he, is, he, he has a Mr. Darcy quality to him. Um, and it is something I love. Um, you know, I love, the, I love Jane Austen, I love the Regency um, period. It's, it's um, a lot of fun. Um, so it's definitely um, an era that I wanted to put into the book, yeah. I, I like the bits where you're talking about, like, you know, the powder in the wigs to get rid of the, the lice and the fleas and things like that. But yeah. those little nitty-gritty bits of detail, you know, because you don't get them as much in Jane Austen. <laughs> no, no, which is, which is a conversation that he has in the book, actually, about what yeah. Jane Austen glossed over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the nice thing about looking back at a period of history, because that... When we were chatting last week, that was the thing I found most intriguing about what you've done. You're starting the book technically now at the end in, yeah. in effectively a present day that could be now. You yeah. just have to have picked, you know, a few years ago for whatever reason you can tell us. But um, but all the bits that come behind it, they just keep filtering in. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got him being a, a lecturer. Um, a sur he's a surgeon, isn't he? In yeah, yeah. Har Harvard. Um, you know, the early days, you know, he's fallen in love, meet, meeting people, how he keeps his secret from them. You've got the backstory of the, the well, I'm going to say the legality, but there's a team behind him that mm. can control things so he can just get on with what he wants to get on with. There's so many little pieces there, but they're all hidden just behind him, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And I find that quite, quite intriguing, really. Mm. You know, to, to, uh, as you turn the page, you don't know what period of time you're going to go back to, in effect. I actually see it as being quite clever, really, Ruth, because it, you, you've created for yourself a franchise. 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, let's think about that. That's quite quite a clever thing to do. Well, I mean, there's, have you read Cross Stitch? You know, they've set, I've got a Scottish backdrop as well, haven't they? Um, Danny Gabaldon. Um, they they go back through periods of time, and that that's that's on Netflix or one of the TV channel. My ex-wife was a big, big fan of them, and uh, Outlander, I think it's called. Ah, yes. oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. love yeah, it. Yeah, well, the, the original book was called Cross Stitch by Danny oh. Gabaldon, but they've got right. that moving through, you know, forwards and backwards through time, mm. you yes. know, as, as a motif. Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, Anne, have you got? Have you going to ask a question of Ruth? Yeah. So, Ruth, what what's next? What's the third book going to be about? Um. I don't, well, I'm thinking about that at the moment. Um, I, I, um, I remain very tight-lipped. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, I, I, there are a few scenes that are currently playing out in, in my mind. Um, that's sort of the way I, I work as a writer. I, I let the, the characters and the scripts sort of form just... It's like having a DVD current, like playing in the back of your head that you're not necessarily watching. Um, and then it's like it kind of gets louder and louder and louder until it's like seriously you need to pay attention to me and I'm like what oh okay sorry I'll write you down um so <laughs> I've got a few ideas flicking around back there um that yeah I need to sort of develop them before I say anything <laughs> yeah we spoke about this I think on the course didn't we the uh, the little creative uh, strategies but uh, mm. we'll save that for another time <laughs> yeah Ruth do you are you a, a notebook keeper of notes or have you got a good oh, yes. memory uh, you know yeah yeah I am um, I always used to carry a little notebook and pen with me um everywhere I go now I just write in the notes function on my phone um but yeah I'm always noting down um things that you know like a sort of if you're not that it's happened lately but um, you know if you're on the bus or whatever and like you know you overhear somebody's talking because people and that's what I'm saying about you know loving language people say the most wonderful things like with the most wonderful turn of phrase that if you were like oh I must remember that and when you got home you'd remember what they said you wouldn't remember exactly how they said it and how they said it is what's important not what the words were and I love capturing um that sort of because it's basically a way of speaking and then you know like I literally will hear somebody say something and I'll think oh my god and I'll just be sitting there like writing my notes on my phone and then I go home and they've just they've created an entire character which has got nothing to do with them um but they've it just sparks a, a whole other character from you know something somebody randomly said on the bus or you know you'll be heard Ever. um yeah you, you just get the most wonderful inspiration um and also the advent of having a phone is brilliant because um my last job we used to have coaches that took us to and from the office and it was a 40 minute journey and sometimes you know I'd be sitting in work and I would have like a, a, a new story or a new scene or a character whatever kind of it's like I'd have it looping in my mind because I knew if I let it play I'd lose it and I'd literally I'd be sitting there having to have this thing go in. And the minute I got on the bus, I'd get my phone out and I would be sitting writing this chapter on the phone. And then I'd just email it to myself. And then when I got home, it was on my computer and I could carry on. So, you know, you don't even have to wait. You can do whatever you are, just write. <laughs> I know a few people who write on the phones, which is brilliant, but I can hardly see my phone. <laughs> <laughs> They're really good at voice recognition these days, Tony. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. know, I know. Yes, no, good point, yeah. yeah. Um, Hazel and Hillary, do feel free to type a question in. Alban, have you got a question? Well, yeah, that, 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 I'm mean, still intrigued by your character. I'm still fretting about him. Do, do, does he have a past and, and did he have a childhood and does he ever find out about it? And does he know why he's different from other people or is that the whole story? Will that ruin the story, for tell me? <laughs> yes, you, you need to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Questions. But you, yes, you, he does. He does tell you about his his childhood and his past in in the book. He does speak of that. So mm -hmm. I'll have to read to find out then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to question actually, Ruth, which is um, when it gets turned into a film or uh -huh. a TV series or you know some sort of franchise. Mm -hmm. Who's going to play the lead character? Who in your ideal world would play that lead character? See, I'm a bit strange, right? Because no. most, most people, <laughs> I know, yeah, you know this already, George. But no, because um, most people, 
they're like, oh, I want, you know, this star. Um, I love it um, when the, per like, especially in TV series, um, when they, they are nobody. Like they, they, the actor is a complete unknown. And so they are the character. I love that. And that's who I would want. I'd want a cast of nobodies um, who become somebodies um, after the, the program. I'd want them because I'd want them to be that character, not to be Leonardo DiCaprio playing this person, yeah. you know, yeah, and yeah. you've kind of got all that back catalog of this is Leonardo DiCaprio. I just want to be like, this is Alex Crowther. And that, you know, I'd want that, that full focus. Yeah. Yeah. Ruth um, Jill's just just said she's really enjoyed, you know, listening to you um, mm -hmm. reading out loud. She's she's dipped out. Um, Hillary has just said, "Did you toy with writing a chapter or more from Cara's perspective?" That's a good question. I don't know how to get out. Um, no. Um, the thing with Cara is that. Uh, there's a very careful balance between the different characters of, uh, because it's all told in the third person, which is um, deliberate. It means that we can flip between characters if we want to, but I think I only do it once or twice um, during the whole book uh, because the majority of it is from Alex's point of view. Um, and it's sort of important for her character that if you got inside her head, you might see her differently. So it's important that she is perceived in a certain way, um, which uh, the way I've written it enables it. If I had a, ca a chapter specifically from her perspective, um, you would see her very differently. Uh, and that might be something potentially that could come into a, a future book um, if it lent itself to it. Is that a spin-off franchise, is <laughs> it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if people would want the spin-off franchise of her character. Um, <laughs> She, yeah, she, she's the one my friend wanted to kill. <laughs> right. OK. Uh, I, I, was, I was just thinking in terms of, you know, it's a spin-off of Frasier from Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> just a thought for you, that was all. <laughs> one other quick thing, Ruth, I don't know if you've looked into it yet, but aud audible and audio versions. Have you mm -hmm. actually thought about you or someone else, you know, sitting down and doing that, you know? reading yeah. all the way through <laughs> yeah um i mean i would do it myself um you know my degrees in theater studies so as you you might have gathered from the way i read the book yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm used to reading out text but um i'd want it read by a man um obviously um because i'd i'd want it to be his voice um that was reading the book and it is something that i definitely would like to do in the future um but i'm not doing it right at this moment um because um, there are some, uh, nothing to do with me, but there are some issues going on with Audible. So I'm going to just wait until oh. those are over um, before I make an audiobook. <laughs> well, you'll have to tell me more about that when we're not, we're not on a big <laughs> platform. Then. Um, so um, Hilary asked a quick, uh, Hazel, who's sort of in the loop of going in this direction, um, you know, if there's anything you want to ask Ruth, just, just oh, ha, here we are. So can you see it, Ruth, or do you need me to read uh, it? Yes, I can see it. Uh, I'll, I'll read it out. Um, because you seem like a person who has a very vivid imagination. Yep. <laughs> do you ever find that you dream something and it's so vivid uh, that it's as if you are conscious, but then you actually wake up and it's gone and you really wanted to write it down, but you can't? Uh, if so, how have you dealt with that? Are there any strategies for remembering that uh, you have learned? Um, yes, um, there. you can make yourself dream whatever you want, is one really bizarre strategy, which um, George should probably agree with. Um, you actually can make yourself dream anything you want. So um, when I've been writing before and it's you know getting late and I've got to get up for work the next day, but I want to keep writing, um, I you know save it, log off, uh, go to bed and then I'm like okay let's do the next bit and then I go to sleep um, and then when I wake up in the morning my brain might have read me the next chapter and I'm like oh that's interesting I didn't know I was going to write that um, so then I can make a few notes before work and then write it when I get home so um, you can literally command your brain to dream specific things um, it, it works as well if you're if you're having a nightmare you can um, acknowledge you're having a nightmare 
and change to a topic you prefer without waking up. Wow. Yeah, it's quite a bizarre thing to do, but you can do it, and it's quite nice uh, <laughs> if you want to do that. There's been a lot of people having, well, what, what you, you or I have described as nightmares recently, you know, keep seeing it on people's Facebook and Twitter. You know, people are struggling at the moment with obviously what's going on in their mind consciously. It's mm -hmm. affecting them, you know, through their, you know, mm -hmm. their sleep patterns. And a lot of people aren't sleeping all night and they're getting up at two in the morning. I mean, I, I had that back in March when I had either real COVID or something similar that was a really bad cough and everything. You know, I, I was just couldn't sleep. You know, I was just awake all night. I didn't do anything creative then, though, like some people. <laughs> I, should, I should have been sat there thinking of a story, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, tell, tell, tell you, no, seriously. Like, yeah, tell yourself a story. Yeah. Put yourself to, to sleep by telling yourself a nice, happy, calm, relaxing story about something yeah. that, you know, it's your story, make it up, you know, do whatever you want. Um, but you can do that. Um, I mean, if you, if you, you've, I mean, yes, we have dreams and then we think, oh, I can't remember that. But sometimes it's like if you, almost turn a spotlight if you kind of like you know turn your turn a searchlight inside your head and actually move it around and try and focus on where that that dream maybe was because you know you kind of have the dregs you can't remember it you can't remember the detail but you have the dregs and if you focus your spotlight on the dregs and just sort of leave it there all day long whilst you go off and you know do whatever you're doing so you're not consciously thinking about it but it's like your subconscious might go oh they're actually interested because they're shining a spotlight on me and it might come back to you it might not but some I've had that sometimes it does come back and then you can write it down but it's never as good as it was in the dream because you've never no. you never 100 get it back yeah i think paul hazel's panicking about waking up in the middle of a nightmare which is uh i don't know if that's a good or a bad thing <laughs> well it's good to wake up in the middle of a nightmare because then you can stop having the nightmare ah that's it yeah well, and change, maybe, and change maybe it john, to a happy thing yeah john, john carpenter and stephen king didn't didn't quite do that did they <laughs> <laughs> julie have you have you got a question you're, you're nice and quiet down there julie's she's on mute as well uh um just i have to be honest i'm so tired i'm oh. kind of... <laughs> <laughs> apologies that's all right enjoy no, herself. Look, ruth, ruth answered most of my questions and the the question about who the the character who you would have played the character i'd already asked you hadn't i in an email yeah, a couple yeah. of weeks ago so oh, right. i d yeah. didn't know that <laughs> Yeah, you don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> On a need-to-know basis, that's all. Thinking forward so that you it's obvious to some extent you are going to write more, isn't it? You're not going to just leave it as done and dusted after two books. It, it is going to continue, isn't it, yeah? Probably, yes. Yeah, no, it, I, I would hope so. <laughs> are you now looking for bits of history? and Because you, you did tell me about you're very careful about if you're going to use a real person. Mm that they're just blended in and subtly used. Mm -hmm. They don't become too much yeah. of a reality within your your creation, yeah. which I think is the right, I think that's the best way of doing it. But are you now, when you're watching telly or reading other books, seeing a period of history that you weren't maybe huge on, that you're now thinking, oh, I really should write about that period. Have you become curious? Um, not yet. I have had too much going on. <laughs> <laughs> um but um yeah I have sort of my, my brain has my brain's sort of subconscious has started thinking about you know we can have a scene here or we can have a scene there I mean what I tend to do is um I try and set scenes places where I've been because you know you can research places and obviously you know being in New York in the early 1900s is going to be very different from being New York in the 21st century but if you've been to New York then at least you've got an idea you know so I tried to use places where I have been um and uh which I've been to quite a few places so that's good for my character <laughs> well the yeah, perk of writing is is the research if you can if you can get to go somewhere that you can use as a, a vacation holiday but then at some point build it into a story so you know off to venice you go or, or and it's you know, all tax like deductible 
Well, it technically, <laughs> yeah, oh, tax no, deductible. No, te te technically, is George, you're right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I've got, an, I've got an author friend who um, he he starts off writing about Preston and Lancashire. Alban knows him, a guy called Joe Delaney, and he suddenly penny suddenly dropped that if he went to Romania and Ireland and and other places. <laughs> He could claim it back off next year's tax bill. So he's travelled quite a bit now. He's been to Australia and Canada on, on you know, inverted yeah. commas, work holidays. Originally, it was Preston, Lancaster, Berry and Burnley, all of them, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> In fact, it was extravagant to go to St. Helens or, or Liverpool, both as, a, as a, a character or a real person, you know, when he first started. And now he's uh, jet setting. Have you have you thought of are you reaching out to like American places? Have you got someone over there who's giving you a little bit of a hand over there? Have you got you know a bookseller or someone you know giving you a bit of a champion and thing? Um, no, I mean the book's available worldwide, so it's being sold in America, and I've got a few friends out in America, you know, who bought a copy and obviously are um, there to sort of champion me. But um, yeah, I just sort of. Um, Hoping that word of mouth, really. Um, so, um, if you like my book, go out and tell everyone. Yeah, no, well, you're right in what you say. Buy it for them as a Christmas present. No, you, you're, you're entirely right. I mean, a lot, a lot of truth comes from you know. I'll read it. I can tell someone. Alban can read it. He can tell someone. That doubles all the time, and all of a sudden, you you can do quite well. There's a thing called book bub. B U B. Yes. And Dave McCluskey was on with us last week, and he's re he's rewritten a Christmas Carol in rhyme, and he's mm. just had it done as an audible, and it's really good actually. But he signed up for Book Bub um, about a month ago. Uh, it's not a huge cost, about eighty quid, but you're sort of guaranteed to get like four hundred people read your book, and then hopefully that bubbles on. And he he was quite pleasantly surprised that. You know, he, he invested, say, 80 quid, and in two weeks, he'd, he'd had, like, 120 quid of royalties come in. So mm. small but but steady, and that sometimes is, you know, a, a way to go. And have you looked at bookshop.org yet, the new um, sort of alternate to Amazon that's just come up? Um, no, I, I know of it, though. Yeah, it's worth looking at because you can put whatever you want on your page, whereas you try putting much on Amazon other than you know who you are they don't like you referring off amazon do they no which is understandable <laughs> oh, yeah, no but they're, they're, i mean they're very controlling <laughs> of that. but bookshop.org you can set your page up with your book cover you know your website and everything they don't complain if you're saying buy my book here you know that they, they, they just want an alternate to amazon really and um yeah it's starting to look like it it got got grounds anyway Sometimes it's good to get in when they start. Sometimes wait and see what happens, really. So um, does mum want to ask a question? Sometimes you never know if your mum or dad knows much about what you've done. Have, have you read the book, Val? Have you? Uh, yes, I have. I've read them both yeah. several times as they've grown along. <laughs> um, and it's been very interesting. We've had some quite depth discussions, haven't we? Yeah about it as it's been coming along but I, I'm, I'm very proud to see them both there or, or, uh, and they sit on my bookshelf mm -hmm. so I haven't got <laughs> any questions no that's okay <laughs> my, my mum's my proof uh, um, proofreader that, that's so important isn't like, it I think you, you need someone with Hawkeye and my mum has Hawkeye yeah. if you will yeah. see them <laughs> Between, between us, we see most of them, not all yeah. of them. No, well, I, it, I, I do. I honestly believe that I, I personally never read a published book that did not contain at least one e error. Oh yeah, like, oh yeah, it's impossible. Well, if you think like the average book is like eighty-five thousand to one hundred twenty-five thousand words, to do that with no errors, it's not possible. Oh no, no, <laughs> it's, and it's often the thing is you, you've written it, I've edited it, she's proofread it. It's then given to one more person who goes mm -hmm. over it. And they often don't tell her, him or you, but they suddenly think they've spotted something and go and change it. You know, it's, I've seen it. I've seen characters change their name in a book once. You know, <laughs> seriously, honestly. But, you know, it is hard when you start writing that you might absolutely categorically know what your character looks like and what they're called. And then someone else suddenly thinks, oh, we don't know if he's got blonde or brown hair. I'll give him her. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it, it suddenly changes halfway through the book. But, um... I, I do character descriptions um, for all my characters. So, um, you know, they have, uh, you know, not just 
um, visual descriptions, but you know, their entire personality basically, um, which I can refer back to for consistency. And obviously with this book, um, I had to plan out his entire family tree as well. Oh, well yeah, um, well that's part of how the book gets going, isn't it? It's that delving back immediately into his mm. existing family tree. That, mm. And his worry is that he was 30 when he last interacted with someone and they're of age, they're, you know, they're 80, something like that, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and, and you know, what, what's that going to be like when they meet? You know, uh, how can you explain not losing all your hair and your teeth and having a bad back? Because this is poor uncle, you know, he's got all these things now because he is 80. You know, it's a mm. great sort of plot device. I, you know, I really do like that. Um, other than this series, then, are you working on anything else? Have you got other other ideas and plans in the pipeline? Um, I do have another book, which I was rewriting when the idea for Immortal came about. And so it is still sitting on my computer because Immortal took over. Um, but it's it is something that I want to go back to. Um, but yeah, whether or not I'll be going back to that or um, focusing on writing part three, uh, of Immortal um, next. I'm not sure yet. Thing is, though, it's as long as you keep it saved safely, um, back it up on your cloud or whatever, you, you can go to it anytime. That's the beauty about writing. There's no age bracket that says, oh, you know, you, you've got to stop when you hit 65 or, you know, Mary Wesley. I think she was 70 when she was first published. Mm -hmm. You know, she did really well for 10 years. Um, I think Bernie Caldwell's a good age, you know, the historical writer, um, you know, how old was Dickens through his period of and be, being a bit more knowledgeable of him? So, sorry, say that again. How, how old did Dickens, how old was he when he died? Because he wrote right to the yeah, end. 1812 to 1870, so you've got 58. Oh, so he was a tiny bit yeah. younger than my, my brain had him as, yeah. Yeah, 58. Yeah. So we've got chance if... Um, Oh, Alban saying he can't tweet without making errors these days. That's because you follow me, mate. I, it rubs off. <laughs> I, thought I blame the graylings on my phone. <laughs> oh, Alban, no. if you're on Twitter, do do follow Alban. Actually, terminally tangerine is a great Twitter handle. It's not. <laughs> I love it. But that, that's my id. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, that's you my know, dark it's, side. <laughs> yeah, but no, he, he joins in with some of the the common political, you know, memes going on. And it's quite funny seeing someone you know comment on, um, you know, I, I'm just going to use Michael Gove as an example. It doesn't have to be him. But, you know, someone will retweet at Michael Gove and suddenly Alban or someone I know will pop into the timeline and say something thinking, I know who that is. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's embarrassing for me as well. <laughs> no, but you see, you've you'll come up with a, a clever pseudonym. My problem is my, my main Twitter name is Tony Does Books. So my friend who's helping me with my website, whatever, says, you, 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 you've got to have just a book persona now. You can't just have this, this you know, books one minute, politics the next. So the Tony Does Books one's just going to go back to being like Tony Higginson or whatever. And beyond books, you know, the, the company name is now my official book Twitter. But I've only got 100 followers in the moment. So it's hard work building it up, you know, but it'll get there. It'll get there. Anyway, guys, we've got a couple of minutes if anyone does want to, other than was, say thank you to Ruth. Um, I was else? just going to say, Tony, yeah, um, I mean, and it, it relates to what Ruth was saying about finding mistakes in the books and uh, proofreaders going through and correcting things and Grammarly going in and correcting stuff. And But it's the things that it misses. And I think Julie knows what I'm going to be talking about here. And maybe we should have um, one of these evenings about what nearly got past Ooh. <laughs> you, have you got like, something you can think of ruth <laughs> that you I nearly have, left in I've, it, you I've, know. I've, I've, I've had this conversation with julie <laughs> <laughs> i have plenty when i nearly i wrote something about the meeting we had recently tony with invest sefton oh yeah and the v and the c on the keyboard are very close oh no <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and spell check Grammarly went, yeah, that's fine. That's a word. It's written correctly in the sentence. And yeah. I was just about to press the button to send it. Yeah. Um, 
frequently we tell people that their course starts on Monday, but if you miss the U out or you miss the O out, it says your curse starts on Monday. Yeah. Um, <laughs> plenty of parking outside the horse. We've had that nearly get through. Um, it's Christmas, so it's time for some nice mice pies. We've had that nearly get out. So I've got I have a whole Going to list. Costco shorty. Oh, yeah. We <laughs> Going to Costco shorty. Um, yeah. Oh, you, should, you need to write more of these down, actually. Oh, I have. I've got a, I have a document of the all the yeah. all the very very near misses. Yeah. Uh, I haven't. I don't think I've sent out. Oh yes, I have. I have. I sent out one to somebody. Um, I thought I'd said, "Lovely to meet you today," and when she replied to my email, it said, "Lovely to meet you, Toady," and I thought, "Oh, <laughs> oh, she's made a mistake." But it wasn't. She replied to my email as written, and I. <laughs> so yes, I was mortified. That that one actually did get out. But yeah, we've we've had plenty of those. But yeah, yeah. I'll check near misses are uh, are always good too. Yeah, there's definitely fine. definitely maybe Hazel when she's finished writing her uh, thesis or whatever, you know, that there's a project for next year's new clan or whatever, Hazel. Anyway, listen, I think we're, we're, we're about done now. We've Hopefully, we've all enjoyed ourselves. Hopefully, Thanks. you know, we're yeah, all... That's lovely, thank I you. I mean, I'm, I'm seriously looking forward to racing through the rest of the book. So, you know, if you've not read it, give it a go, folks. It's really easy to read. You just get straight into the story. There's plenty of action. The, the, the premise of the character and what his life is about is fascinating, in, in its own entirety but it's the way subtly you just keep picking up more and more story without slowing down because that's the thing with some books you slow down and you have to find a you know a rhythm with with so far with the 100 pages or so I've read the thing I was trying, I'm thinking I, I want to carry on reading but I've got a meeting at one o'clock I've got to stop reading go to my meeting and you know I genuinely just wanted to carry on reading so that's always the best praise you can give any book you read. If you keep reading, you're enjoying it and it's a good book. So I would wholeheartedly give the book a, a huge thumbs up. So if you've not got a copy, make sure you get one, folks. And, uh, you know, if you contact uh, Ruth, you know, she might have some um, copies she can sign. Or have you got any book plates, Ruth? Have you designed any printed stickers that you can use? That's something to look at, you know. Yeah, no, I haven't done um, that yet because my I own the books directly from myself. Like they, yeah. they get sent from the district from yeah. the distributor. Well, if you if you just save the front cover and if you back fade it onto the paper so it's a bit more almost translucent, mm. you could you know you could sign those and post those out to people. That's quite a lot of authors are relying on that because they're not meeting phys physical people yeah, in yeah. bookshops at the moment. No, um, think about. Yeah, but you know you can just buy um, sticky back paper from stationery company either you know be clever and buy a guillotine or pencil lines and nice 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 snipping away but you know they work a treat really just little three by two you know that sort of size yeah yeah brilliant. Um, but you know the image is a nice image anyway but just back faded so you can write on top of it mm. i think would work really nice yeah yeah so there's nice. yet more homework on top of the job <laughs> the <laughs> vegan awesome. research and everything else yeah so the other thing that I'd, I'd just like to add, um, if you have read the book or you're going to read the book, um, please uh, do re leave a review uh, on the store where you bought it. Um, I genuinely really want to know what everyone who reads it thinks. So please, uh, you know, if you've read it and you've enjoyed it, please go and, and leave a review. Um, you can do that uh, you know, on, on any of the stores. Uh, I'm also on Goodreads as well, so you can leave a Goodreads review. You can also leave questions on Goodreads. So if you think of any other questions for me that you haven't asked today, uh, you can go and look me up on my Goodreads profile and uh, drop me a question there and I will answer it. Yeah, no, I think re reviews are so important these days because there aren't enough bookshops. I mean, there's, you know, there's X hundred, but th there's not enough. So if people are shopping online, the encouragement, as a genuine reader you can give to someone else who's looking at a book mm -hmm. is, is so important. I mean, I quite often, you know, I'll, I'll read reviews of books that I've read thinking, have other people agreed with me? You know, and it's interesting to see when people haven't actually. 
Mm. And you're thinking, well, what did they see or not see in that book? You know, but also, you know, you, you don't have to come every Monday, but we are going to run these... Uh, pretty much every Monday. I think the idea is to try and keep it going so people come and go. Well, Julie and I sort of save it and then we're going to load it up on websites, YouTube and things. So we'll, we'll always have a back history for people. Um, not sure if next Monday, um, there's someone Julie and George know who's got in touch with me, but I've got a friend who's written a wonderful music history book. Um, it don't know, it's 750 pages. But don't let that put you off because it, it's very short chunks of information. It's not 750 pages of beginning to end. You can only, it's one of those books you can open at any page, read what he's written about Buddy Holly, Queen, Sex Pistols, and he's cross referenced them all. It, it's just, his mind must be like spaghetti because <laughs> <laughs> it's just absolutely mind blowing. All the info he's got, and he's just, proved the rumour that Elvis Presley didn't set foot in the country because he's found someone who gave Elvis Presley a tour, a physical walking <laughs> tour, and no one else has ever found that out before. The, the photo of Elvis at the bottom of um, a plane, I think he might have been in his army uniform from memory. He came down the steps and waved for the photo, but he never got off the plane. But he's found someone who took, took him on a walking tour around, around the city. So he's got so many fascinating facts in it. So if you've got friends or family who are into music from the 50s right up to the 70s stroke 80s, um, you know, it's a huge big book, but it, it's one of those real, you know, Christmas books in a way that you just keep opening and go, oh, did you know this? Did you know this? You know, but, um, you know, I'm sure everyone tonight has really enjoyed listening to Ruth. And, you know, it's a brave thing to put yourself on television. As you, as you have done really so hopefully it wasn't too daunting no it was lovely and thank you everybody for rocking up and listening to me yeah yeah well and done Ruth. thank you for coming yeah. it's good yeah and obviously it, it it's gone out live on facebook and i'm going to stop the recording now and then later on julie and i'll piece it back together and um you know Put, put it in, in other places and keep encouraging people. Um, and do have a look at the, make sure you post this song link onto my Facebook page, Ruth, and I'll share it on some of my music friends as well. Okay, brilliant, yeah. You know, because that's something that's easy for people, isn't it? You know, and I think, you know, we all need cheering up, don't we? I'm assuming it's quite a happy song. <laughs> it is, no, it really is. And I mean, I've, I have put the link in, in the chat just now. So if anybody yeah. does want to go and, and have a listen um, after this session, it's a lovely song. It is called Stay Strong. We we did actually write it um, in October last year. So no sniffs of COVID at all um, at the time. But, you know, we, we couldn't have possibly known how apt the song would be when we released it in June this year. Um, and, yeah, and the feedback has been people have... have, have uh, we released a, a virtual music festival and um yeah uh, yeah people just said that it, it's it's made them cry in a good way <laughs> and it's it's just a sort of a really um quite emotive song right now so please do go and, and have a listen to the free music video and then you can download the song if you like and we also a yeah, free bonus uh track which is a piano version which is really beautiful right guys i'm going to stop the recording